Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking the time to be with us here today on our webinar. This webinar is being brought to you by UC Irvine, and today we'll be talking about predictive analytics and uh, business intelligence uh, related to one of our international certificate programs. Before we get going, I just want to make sure everybody uh, understands, use, if you need questions, and please feel free to ask questions along the way, you guys should have a chat and a uh, Q&A button up on the right-hand side of the screen. And let me point that out so you can't quite see it. Let me get my little pen up here, pencil. So up in this corner of the screen on your, on your screens, you should see a chat and a Q&A box. Uh, please use those. We will be monitoring those for questions along the way. Uh, the University of California has 10 campuses, and uh, the University of California at Irvine, which is where we are, we're broadcasting from Irvine, uh, is in Southern California. And it's a, again, very, very beautiful climate here, very Mediterranean climate. Uh, the population in the area is around 3 million, and it is really the, the center here, kind of the tech coast of uh, California's area. There's some beautiful pictures here of, of us. Uh, we are near Disneyland. We are near the beach. Uh, it's a very, very beautiful climate here uh, in Southern California. We're just south of Los Angeles again in Orange County. The university itself, uh, the, this Irvine campus of the University of California is uh, the number one university under 50 years old in the United States, and that came from the Times Higher Education. Uh, we're number nine among all the nation's uh, best public universities. Uh, we're number 50 in the academic ranking of world universities, and that's from uh, uh, Shanghai University, and we have three Nobel Prize winners. And we're also the coolest school, and that, that's mostly related to uh, how green our school is. And I'm going to change my color so you guys can see it there. So that is us, the University of California at Irvine. Again, it's part of the 10 campus system of the University of California that includes uh, UCLA, uh, Berkeley, and, and seven other campuses, one of the largest university systems uh, in the world. Uh, and again, here's our campus, a very, very large campus. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get a very large land grant many, many years ago. Uh, so the campus is spread out, uh, and that's very nice. We've got a lot of space. Um, it's a very large campus. We have about 30,000 undergraduates uh, at the University of California. There are several international programs. We have a lot to focus on English language, uh, and, and that's a, a wonderful set of programs for people that are trying to improve their English skills. Uh, we also have what we're going to talk about today is our short certificate program, accelerated certificate programs, where you get a certificate, and you can also uh, qualify for internship and OPT. And these are great for people that are looking to you know, get connections in uh, to jobs here in the United States. Uh, we also have a, a bunch of university prep programs that help people that want to get into U.S. schools. Uh, so there's a wide range of things that we do for internationals. We've got a very strong team here that supports the group, and they do a lot of fun things. Uh, the accelerated programs that we'll be talking about today are three months in, in length. Our university uh, is on the quarter system. Our quarters are 10 weeks long, uh, so that's, again, three months. Uh, it's sometimes 10, little, sometimes it might go into 11 for a couple extra classes, but uh, about a three-month program, and it's a full-time set of courses. Uh, that's a requirement to, to get visas over here. And again, as we mentioned, there's intern and OPT uh, potentials there as well. Now, what I'm going to talk about, which is really my deal here, is one of the new uh, accelerated certificate programs, and this is a very fun, very excited area, uh, and it's in these two words, data science, right up here, and predictive analytics, and it's focused for business professionals. And there's really two graphics here. This one here is, is part of data science. It's visualizing data, and you don't have to worry about exactly what that particular chart's looking at. I didn't make it large enough to see it. But it was just a way to look at a particular set of data in a way that made it more valuable so that you could dig out the little nuggets of potential value to your business and, and, and possibly you know, increase your market share or increase sales. 
So that's a real brief shot of what data science is. And predictive analytics is over here. It's a little bit different, but related. Predictive analytics is trying to give a score to people, in, in most cases, on, on some kind of a rating. Usually it's a rating like, can I sell you a new cell phone? Or uh, can I sell you some more of my, uh, my product? Other times it's ratings like, will you, are you likely to commit a crime? You know, so there's a lot of different potential ratings, but you're usually trying to give somebody a number, uh, a 12 or a 79. Okay, that, that range is valuable to you. If you know one of these people is a 12 and the other one's a 79, that's a good way for you to eliminate somebody from uh, your campaign or your investigation and focus on only those that have a high probability of doing what you want them to do or in some cases what you don't want them to do so that you can uh, solve crimes. Okay, and you've all seen this, right? So if, when you go on to Amazon, it tells you something here. It says, customers who bought this might also like, and this is for me, right? So it knew that I was a data science guy, so it showed me all these other cool books about data science. Except I don't know about this one. This one is, uh, Predictive analytics for dummies. I don't know. That didn't make me feel good when they put that one out there. Uh, just kidding. But that that is is real typical, right? Same thing with this is LinkedIn, right? So LinkedIn told me uh, I might know. This is a university, uh, uh, our university's uh, uh, club, one of the clubs on campus. So uh, yeah, it made sense that I might know them. But all of the process. There's a lot of process, but that Amazon goes through to serve you up these very specific uh, books because it, it's trying to get you, uh, it's only got a few seconds of, of your time to see uh, these books and it's got to show you the ones that you're absolutely the most likely to buy. So there's science and there, there's um, c computer science and some marketing behind what they do there and that's what we're going to talk about. Same thing with Facebook or anybody else that, that suggests things to you. So we've all seen this. And this is all under the category of the power of data in business. The more you use the data that you have, the more competitive you can be. And that's incredibly important. So what are we looking at? Typically with data in business, there's, there's three major categories. One is data about the past and, and looking about what has happened in the business. Or, or, you know, what, and this is really, uh, it could be current tense and it could be past tense. So it's, it's um, what is happening or what did happen. And this is typical of, of a lot of large businesses. They have a management information system or business intelligence. Uh, but it's really about what data do we have right now related to our business? How is it stored and accessed? And, and, you know, you're talking about a lot of IT parts of the business, uh, but also it's looking backwards. It's looking at things that have already happened uh, with the business. The present uh, tense is more about why is it happening? So the, the people that do these kind of roles in, in companies now are business analysts. Sometimes they're data scientists. Uh, they're looking at trends. They're looking at insights at, at uh, what is happening and why. So I like to picture it here where we've got a person in the car. Uh, he's looking backwards, which is this stuff over here, uh, into the past. He's looking where he's been. And he's looking out forward, which is the next uh, thing in the future. And where he's sitting in the car at the time in his driver's seat, he's really here in the present. So now let's go forward and say, what do I see down the road? Well, that's the future. What will happen? And more importantly, what should happen? And how can I change what's going to happen in the future? And that's the other words, predictive analytics, forecasting, optimization, all very similar words, but it's using past behavior, giving the person a number, and trying to predict future outcomes. And again, that's incredibly powerful for a business because if businesses can do that, then they can be much more valuable and all businesses in the world 
realize that they cannot be competitive anymore based on their product. They can only be competitive based on how good their product is and how much they know about their customer, so they have to compete on data. So in this one, we're looking at a, a little bit different chunk of, the, of where, how the data is created here. Uh, again, in, in this case, there's a bunch of different data. Here is data down at the bottom that companies typically store. There's financial data, there's data about the product, there's data about order management, there's data about uh, inventory. And where does that data come from? The company ha collects a lot of data. Uh, the company data itself is up here. Companies are selling things. Uh, their finance department is recording the transaction. They've got a lot of operational data. So that's one place where data comes from. Another place is public information. The customers you have, your own financials, compliance, logistics, all of that is public information, and that goes into your system. And then there's other private data that comes from your, either your customers give that to you or your vendors or your partners, and that information also gets dumped into your, what, what I'm calling here an enterprise bridge. So you've got all three sources of data, and what you need to do is, is come up with some kind of a way to put a dashboard on this so it's easy to see this data. You can operate on it, maybe do our predictive analytics, do some uh, process collaboration. A lot of things you can do, but you've got you to realize that a lot of the data is in silos. And these are usually different parts of the organization. The, the financial team is a whole different part of the organization. And although I've drawn this and this on the same picture, uh, they're completely different departments. So what has to happen is somebody's got to overlay on top of them some kind of enterprise bridge where people that need to see this data can see any of the data that they need. And, and again, this is not a trivial amount of work here. Uh, to, to get the dashboard, pull that enterprise bridge together. And there's a lot of need for people that understand how to do this as well. Uh, it's not as much something we're going to focus on in, in this class, uh, but I just want to give you a sense of how, the, how a typical di a company stores information. Now let's talk about a little bit more what we're going to do in, the, uh, in this particular Accelerated Certificate Program. In the Accelerated Certificate Program, we're going to start right here. Uh, this is number one. We're going to define our, our goal. What are we, problem are we trying to solve? Are we an insurance company? Are we uh, marketing a new iPhone? You know, what's, what's our, our, our company? And then what specific business problem are we trying to solve? So that's the first thing. So we will actually have a class to, to help people understand how to do a good job of this. You've got to figure out what you want to do first. So goals, figuring out your goal. And again, that may not be simple. Um, then you've got to collect some data. So you're going to pull in a lot of data. You might already have some of that data. You might have to go get some new data, but you've got to collect the data. And then you've got to clean up the data because data that you get does not always have complete information. Some people might, might not have put their telephone number into the record. So then you've got to decide, well, if I don't have his telephone number, can I still use his, his record? Is his record valuable to me? Do I have some other way of contacting him? Or if he didn't put it in and I've got no other way, I don't have an email or anything else, then, then I can't use that record and I've got to delete it. But it's things that people need to decide themselves. They've got to decide based on what their business objective is. So preparing and cleaning up the data. Then, typically at that point, you start visualizing it. You start doing some visualization, some simpler visualization of the data to try to help give you some insight on the problem that you defined up here in your business goals. And in some cases, even then, you can make some decisions, and that's where we're down here. So you may be able to make some decisions at that point. But the next step most companies do is look into the future. Now I'm trying to say, all right, using this data, I want to develop a model that tells me how somebody might act in the future. 
or maybe there's some pattern that says maybe after a woman between 20 and 30 years old that's from the east coast of the United States, maybe when she buys a handbag, the next most likely purchase for her are gloves. And we don't know that that's, that's true or not. We'd have to test that and see if that's true. But that's a really, if, if we can prove that, that that's true quite often, then that's a really valuable thing to, for us to know. And that's a model, and that's what we're looking for. It's kind of a gold nugget or a gold egg. We're trying to look for some pattern in the data that might not be obvious to us. And, and we can experiment. We can try a lot of different things and say, you know, I've been in this business for five years. Or I've just got a hunch that after they buy an iPhone, most likely their next purchase is going to be a case. Well, that one's pretty obvious, but uh, a lot of times you're looking for not obvious things. So you're developing models here. And that takes a bit of time and a little insight, and it's really a combination of some science, but also some art and, and business. And it's more art and business than it is science. Then what you do is you say, okay, I found a few patterns in the data. Now I've got to go deploy it. I've got to go out to my, my website like Amazon, and I've got to hook it up to my website. I've got to have my website identify who's coming in so that it can host up and post up information to that person that tells them that they indeed um, you know, might like the books, the ones I just showed you for, for me, right, the data science book that Amazon and that's, that's not a trivial thing to deploy the model. It, it, and then you refine it, you tighten it up, but that's, that's a bit of work. And then, then you're affecting outcomes. And again, it doesn't take a lot of effect to change the business. If you change your, your um, uh, conversion rate, by even a slight amount from, from two to two and a half percent, you're going to make a tremendous amount of profit without spending a lot of money. So again, the predictive side of this is really about the scoring, scoring people about what they might do in the future. Now, why is this so valuable now? And, and the, 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 the main thing you guys need to know is the, the job market for people that know this stuff is just amazing. And we'll go over to Monster in a minute. And you can do it too. Go to Monster or Dice or any of the, uh, the, the career builder websites and type in some of these words, data science, business analysts, and you'll just see there's just thousands and thousands of jobs because there's not too many undergraduate degrees in this subject area. And uh, so kids are coming out of school that don't have the skills, yet industry is demanding those skills. There's a very big gap between the supply and the demand. And the reason this has happened is the amount of data that's being collected is just, just dramatically increased with, with cell phones, with uh, click-through traffic on websites. You know, Google and, and most companies are tracking every click that you make on their website. Uh, and that is a tremendous amount of data. They're tracking where you are on your cell phone uh, based on the GPS, right? So that is just incredible amount of data. Then the middle part here is the, the knowledge that used to be required to do um, this kind of analysis used to be reserved for people with PhDs in computer science or statistics. What has happened in the last seven or eight years is the software has made it a lot easier to use this uh, difficult math. Uh, and, and people now can use a fairly simple software like the one we're showing here, which is the one we will use in our software. It's called StatSoft, and it's from Dell Computer. And it, it allows you to use the software without, uh, or these, math, these mathematical uh, processes, without understanding all the details. And honestly, you don't need to understand the details. What you need to understand is how you can use these tools to help your business. So that has really improved the ability for a lot more people to use these more sophisticated tools and still get a lot of valuable, valuable uh, uh, business uh, data from that. 
And then, of course, the last thing is computers and, and disk space has gotten cheaper and faster, and that always helps everything. So what are we looking for when we're doing predictive analytics? And this is one of the books that we use in the class. It's a, a very light uh, read. Uh, it's actually a relatively uh, inexpensive book. It's a paperback now, and it's by my good friend Eric Siegel, uh, who has written and designed, helped us design this course uh, of study. Uh, and a lot of these uh, next couple slides are based on information from Eric's book, but it's really simple again. You have some data, you try to create some model, uh, and you do it a bunch of different ways. You're sitting on your computer and you're figuring out in different ways. You're also, again, using your business insight. But what you're looking for is some new view of the data that, that really helps you. It's like a golden egg. It's a little nugget of gold that is in the data. And that's why they used to call this data mining. They used to call it, and they still do in many cases, you dig through data to try to find patterns that can help you. And that's, that pattern is some kind of a predictive model. So let's take a look at what those could look like. So let's, here's an example of, and this is from Eric's book again, and you guys can take a look. Eric's, it's a really good book. We will use it in these classes, but if you choose to not take this course right now, you still want to learn about this, Eric's book is a really good way to get an idea. But this is a little example from Eric's book. So pretend you are a bank. If you are a bank and, and you give mortgage loans, if you give mortgage loans, then you do not want to have the person that you gave the loan to, you, you don't want them to pay the loan off. Because if they pay the loan off, you lose money. So you want them to keep the loan, and you want them to keep paying their monthly payments, because that's how they make money. So your business goal is to identify those people who might be in a category of wanting to pay their loan off early. And if you can identify them, then maybe you can do something to them to keep them from paying their loan off early. So this is a little technique that, that's a little bit easier to understand. It's called a decision tree. And uh, what happens is the software helps you build these trees, but you still have to guide it a little bit. But let's look at this one. It's just a decision tree. So this says, is their interest rate less than 7.9? Yes, they go over here. No, they go over here. And if, if their interest rate is not less than 7.5, which means it's greater than, I'm sorry, 7.9, then you ask another question. Is their mortgage less than 182,000? Uh, and again, some of those numbers are numbers that you have to kind of guess at to try to figure out where the sensitivity is. So then we go down and say, okay, if his mortgage is, if his interest rate is high and his mortgage is low, then that starts to tell a story. That means he's, the person might be thinking, dude, I've got to pay this loan off. I've got a small loan and I've got a high interest rate. Uh, I might be a candidate for, you know, in doing something uh, like paying my loan off, refinancing. And then there are a couple other questions that we put in there, loan-to-value ratio. How much is your house worth? If your house is worth uh, a lot compared to your mortgage, you've got a lot of equity in it, that's really what that question is asking. And then it's a little interesting. Then they ask a second question about the mortgage rate. And they said if the mortgage rate is less, if the mortgage is less than 67000 see, there's two places we ask the same question. Uh, but one of them is after we ask this question. So you don't have to understand all the details here, but the idea is people, you know, this wasn't a computer science decision. This was a, a, a business decision that somebody made to build this table out. And honestly, what they did is they built a bunch of tables. And again, the software helps you do that. But we went down a few more trees, and here's, here's a person that, uh, you know, is down this tree, and then he's down this tree right here, and then he comes over and goes down this tree and down this tree. And if he's in that category, he's got a 25% chance of paying his loan off early, whereas the guy over here has only got 3 or 2% or 6%. So this is a very good target market. And if you follow some of the other lines through here, you see that this one's also very, very high, 40%. 
This is a guy that uh, does not own a condo. It's a single family home. So it's these two target markets that are much more important for you to deal with. And that helps you a lot. Because if you can eliminate all of these other people from your campaigns, from your phone calls, from, from your ads, you save a lot of money. And that's going to help you run your business better. And that's just a, a one quick little example. So you guys, we're doing this right now with you. We're doing a webinar or we're sending a, you a brochure. And we're hoping that that brochure and the time we are spending here on this webinar converts you over and that you show up here at the University of California next year or the year after. And that's an important, important process. So let's look and see why this is so important. So let's say, you know, we're marketing to you guys. And again, this is another great example from my good friend Eric. So we're marketing to a very large audience. We are a big company and we're marketing to an audience of one million people. When you market, you usually get a very small response rate. We all get these advertisements in emails, in the mail, and we say, you know, I, I, this is junk, and they just throw it away. Every once in a while, somebody picks it up and says, hmm, maybe I'll do something, but it's a very small number, usually 1%, 2%. So most people did not respond. So what we want to do is say, let's, let's figure out a way to find a, a smaller number of people to talk to, a smaller number of people that are higher likelihood of doing what we want them to do. In the case of the previous slide, it was to get you guys to come here. In the case of the one before that, it was to make sure the person didn't pay off their loan. But in any case, it's something we want them to do or not do. But we want a smaller group of people. So let's just say somehow with our decision tree or something else, we figured out a way to get the number down and at the same time get the response rate higher. So even though we only went from 1% to 3%, it saves us a ton of money. And let's see why. It costs us $2 every time we send out the brochure. Now, when we get somebody to actually buy our product, we make $220. But if we've got a million people that we're sending this to, and we only get a 1% response rate, then we get 10,000 people buying our product. But we sent out a million at $2. That cost us $2 million. And if our product profit is 220, but we only got 10,000 of them, if you do the math right, you, you made 2,200,000, but you spent 2 million on your marketing campaign, which means your profit was only $200,000. But if you reduce the size of your mailing list down to 250, and you got a higher response rate, then you only spent $2 times 250,000, which is half a million dollars. It's still a lot of money, but you got 7,500 responses, and each of those gave you $220. And if you do the math there, you're going to end up making $1.1 million versus only $200,000. And the key is you didn't do anything different except change your model and look at your data, and that's relatively inexpensive to do. That's why companies are doing this a lot, because using a data scientist to figure out how to go from this side to this side, you know, it takes a little bit of time, but it's not nearly as expensive as sending out four or five uh, or a couple million uh, brochures or uh, anything else that might be expensive to get a hold of these customers. So that gives you an idea. But there's a lot of questions. So you guys have all done this, right? There, you have a cell phone. And um, the company says, all right, well, your cell phone is a, uh, contract is about to expire. So there's a lot of art to this. So the question is, do you want to tell them about that? Because the customer, and this is another good example from Eric's book again, Eric Siegel. Uh, the customer thinks like this. He's got a contract 
his contract kind of puts him in a cage. He doesn't like being in a cage. He knows that his contract ties him up for two years. So if you send him a little flyer or send him an email message that says, hey, you can get out of your contract, um, then he might start looking around at the competitors. So the question is, is it better to advertise to this guy or not? You might lose him. And I, I don't have a clear answer for that question right now, but it's the kinds of questions that data scientists and predictive analytic people use in, uh, in their daily lives. They gotta answer these kinds of questions uh, as they start thinking about their campaigns. Now let's talk a little bit more about the campaigns. The campaigns can be different depending on what you're doing. We talked about Amazon. In Amazon, you want them to buy something, right? If you're a police agency, you want to find them before they commit a crime or do some kind of fraudulent activity. So you're looking for something different. If you're in the healthcare industry, you're trying to figure out, you know, what groups of people get what kinds of diseases and somehow get a hold of them and try to do something preventative to that group. You know, everybody knows about all the things that you should do to be healthy, uh, but if you're in a certain class of individuals with a certain age, with a certain genotype, then you might be more likely to get a certain disease. So if the healthcare professionals can tell you about that, then they can start targeting you with things that you can do to improve your odds. And uh, that can be very valuable for, for them because it lowers their cost, but also for you because it improves your health. We talked about the banking industry. Uh, we, you know, real estate's very important. Uh, things that uh, like eHarmony and Match.com and all the dating sites, you know, they're doing this. They're building models that try to match you up with people and have, uh, you know, you like each other and uh, get married and all that. And then again, voting is very important. In the United States a couple years ago when President Obama uh, had a, a very strong challenge from Mitt Romney, uh, President Obama, uh, his team did a lot more analytics. They did a lot more of this stuff. And it helped them focus not only on people in what we call swing states, but in places where they could really affect the outcome. They weren't just looking at undecided voters. They were looking at voters that were persuadable. And there's a big difference between those two. If you can find the persuadable voter and focus on them, and again, it didn't take very much for them to swing a couple of those states in their direction. So again, we talked about you know, what's, what, what you are trying to do. If you are a healthcare professional, you're trying to help treat somebody before they did that. If you're Amazon, you're trying to advertise or recommend or discount a product. Uh, you know, if you're the police, you're trying to go out and investigate, and you can't investigate everybody. You've got to pick certain classes of people to investigate because they have higher odds of committing a crime. There's a very large debate about this uh, on, on how much civil rights are, uh, are uh, sometimes uh, lost when you, do, when you do this versus the overall public safety, but certainly with the issues um, in Paris and, and, and other terrorists, that, you know, that's a, a very difficult thing to balance, but it's very important. The key is, though, with these tools, we can do a much better job of that. And the more data we have and the more we understand how to use these tools, the more effective we can be in a large range of professions in the world. And that's what's really quite exciting about uh, these kinds of, of tools. So let's look at some of this in, in, in another way. The other thing that you hear a lot about is big data. So let's look at this in, in, in terms of the, the large amount of data. We're gonna first look at you know, the variety of data. There's a lot of different data out there now. And we lump it into two categories here, structured and unstructured. Structured data is usually put into a, a financial database. And this is Oracle, very, very large uh, software company. Usually um, uh, most big companies use Oracle for their financial database. How much money they have, how many products did people buy, 
That is very structured data. It, it's money. It's very easy to put into a database. Unstructured data is things like a blog post or a tweet or a Snapchat or a YouTube post, you know, or Instagram or anything, right? Those are unstructured. There, there's, there's the text. You know, you don't know if there's a number in there. You don't know too much about that. You don't know really what that text says. You've got to go interpret it. With, with the uh, Oracle Financial Database that's structured, you know what 270 pounds or 7,000 euros, you know what that means. But if somebody posts a tweet, they might be being sarcastic. So you've got to interpret that unstructured data and you've got to store it. But the key is there's so much more of this unstructured data. The unstructured data, and you see up there some of the numbers, right? 40 million tweets every day, 10,000 posts per second in Snapchat, you know, 30 billion posts per month in Facebook, 4 billion hours of YouTube video watched, 80 million photos uploaded on Snapchat, 300 million emails every day, and all of that stuff is unstructured and relative, relatively just absolutely massive, massive data uh, in those data sets, right? So it's just massive. So the volume is very, very large. The variety of the data being structured, unstructured, um, uh, semi-structured is, is massive. But then over here, the velocity, how fast is that data coming in? Well, here's a little example of uh, an iWatch. The iWatch has a potential of monitoring your, your health information on a very regular basis. Um, so there's data coming at a very large stream. And the stream here can get, bit, get even larger. Uh, one of our instructors here uh, at Extension had a pacemaker put in. And the pacemaker has a Wi-Fi connection. So it constantly dumps out information about the health of our instructor's heart um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it dumps it up to his, uh, his physician's website. Now his physician doesn't look at all that. They've got some uh, uh, software tools that do that that try to identify things in his data, his, his heart electrocardiogram, to see if there's anything that, that might be a problem and alert him and his physician. But that data is coming real time. That's the issue here, it's real time. That is a tremendously fast amount of data. And when you have data coming real time, your system has to be different because a lot of other transactions are not real time. Um, another issue is click streams. You, you, you know, when you get on any website, people are tracking every click you make. And that's, that's a lot of data coming in very, very quickly. So this is increasing the velocity of the data coming to us. So when we use all three of these, the variety, the volume, and the velocity, it, it creates a, uh, a very valuable and, and rich source of data, but it's also got to be handled differently. There's so much data uh, in so many different sources that people have to have the skills to be able to pull this data together, to store it, to utilize it, and this is different skills than it used to be because it really, truly is big, big data. And again, this, this number has, has just gone, gone up dramatically even in the last five years or so because we're looking at click streams, because we're looking at logs and emails and graphic information, just massive stuff that's pounding the daylights out of the volume and veracity of the data. Uh, one of the questions that came in, and let me jump to it real quick, James was asking, in your opinion, what attributes should a data analyst or data scientist possess, and how does the new program help get those skill sets? And, and James, let me, I'll, I'll go to the next slide and try to help, help show uh, how our specific courses uh, help with that. Um, but let me, let me cover this slide, and I'll, go, I'll come right back to that question. Uh, this slide tells us a little bit about where we were. We were down here. We were, and many companies are still in this mode, 
And this little uh, acronym here is ERP. It's called Enterprise Resource Management. So you're looking at how to run your business better. So you might have a system that helps you do purchasing. You might have systems that help you figure out how and who bought what products. Um, and that's the enterprise, your company. You're focused on your company. The next kind of branch out is you're focusing on your customer. And CRM, the C is customer. And RM is customer uh, uh, response management, customer record management, customer uh, uh, support. These are all what this is talking about. And you're, look, you're focused on your customer. He's calling in. He's talking to you. You're, you're offering him things. You're, you're touching him more often. You're supporting him. But at the same time, your, your business goal is to sell him more stuff, right? So as we go up this thing, we're using more and more data on this side. And as we go up this side, we're increasing the variety and complexity of the data that we have. So many, many customers, many, many companies have, have these two things, customer response and enterprise response. But then customers go out, and, I mean, companies go out and start getting into the web. So they've got a lot of web logs, they've got some dynamic pricing, they're using search marketing, they're doing behavioral targeting and A-B testing on their websites. So that pushes them out to even more data and even more complexity of what they're doing. Now we move even further out where we're looking at click streams, we're looking at a tremendous number of social interactions on the website, GPS data, a lot of business feeds from other companies, uh, messaging systems, uh, user-generated stuff, and now we're way out here in the big data area. And, and that's where most companies are not in really utilizing big data very well. A lot of companies are doing a pretty good job on the website, but not very many are out here really using big data yet. And that's where this is, uh, uh, good for students that are learning these skills because they they can uh, be very valuable to the organization. So we'll go back to James's questions here. That the things that students need to know, they don't need a master's or PhD in data science or data mining to to be effective here. Now, if you want to be a, a pure data scientist that only does the high end math, then yeah, you might want to go back and get a master's or a PhD in data science. And companies do hire those people. They hire people in those roles, but for every one PhD they hire, they hire 20 to 40 to 50 people in the middle, people with some business skills, people with a little bit of data science and predictive analytics, and hopefully very practically applied predictive analytics and business uh, data science skills. And that's what we put together in our curriculum. The courses in our curriculum are listed here. Each one of these blue boxes is a course in the curriculum. And they are focused and uh, taught by practical people that are doing this for a living. It's not theoretical. The company's hiring primarily the 40 to 50 people they hire for every one uh, theoretical person. They are looking for practical. So let's look at the, uh, the, the courses. The first course, is just an introduction to predictive analytics. And we use the book I showed you already from Eric and one other book here. This book is uh, uh, by the authors of the course that we're ta you're uh, going to take. And it's uh, really valuable because if you happen to take this course in the winter, the authors of these, this book are actually going to come and teach this course the first time. Uh, and that's a really valuable thing. But that's the books we'll use. And that's just an introduction to predictive analytics. It'll give you a real quick uh, overview of how to do everything, uh, but not in a lot of depth. Then what we'll do is we'll come back and say, we really need to talk about the business goals. So there's a really good book we use here called Decision Management Systems. And it's by a guy named James Taylor. James will actually come down, not for the entire class, but he'll come for the first lecture. He's up in San Francisco. Uh, but we'll, we, we will use this book. And you guys can go take a look at some of these books. This is a relatively easy read. It's not heavy technical. Uh, this one is not heavy technical either. This one's a little bit more technical, but it's more practical, example-focused. 
So those are the first two classes. We will be using a lot of software from Dell called StatSoft in the class, which is highly regarded in the industry. Uh, in the next class down here, then we will start looking at cleaning up the data. This is data prep. We will use a lot of the same book for that and one other book, but we'll have a short course on preparing the data. Then we will look at figuring out and doing the modeling. And we will use this book right here, again, by one of the authors of our courses. His name is Dean Abbott, and it's Applied Predictive Analytics. So you get the idea here. Most of these courses are applied. There's not that much theory. We, we do do a little bit of math. We do do a little bit of statistics. Uh, we've got some people in place to help you guys. If you're a little scared of that word, uh, many of our business uh, uh, people are. Uh, we are, have made this course very easy on the statistics side. Uh, but there is a little bit in there. Uh, it's, it's good and it's very valuable for this audience to understand a little bit of it. Uh, so that course is building the models again and deploying them. Uh, and then that, that's really the process uh, of the, the circle we showed you previously uh, on how to go through a predictive analytics. And again, based, based on James's questions, that's really what we're looking for, what people are looking for as far as skills, practical skills. Now let's look at a couple more. So the data science is the next two set of classes. This one right here and this one right here. Uh, those are data science classes, the business applications and then visualization. So again, it's figuring out how to build these images and use some of the software. Tableau is one of the most popular softwares. It's out of Stanford, but it's very, very popular to help people get business insight quickly without a lot of statistics. There is, again, some statistics in there, but it's not as deep uh, and it's easily understandable by most, uh, you know, college students. And you have this on your resume then. You'll have Tableau, you'll have StatSoft, you'll have a lot of these named people. We use some, we do some R programming. You have those on your resume and that is what uh, James's question was. Um, how do these, the students develop these skills? Where there they are. You're going to use a lot of StatSoft. You're going to use a lot of Tableau. When you put those on your resume and you put this particular certificate or any of these courses on your resume and you say, oh, I know Eric Siegel or I, I took a class or I read his book or Dean Abbott, these guys are all recognized in this field. So when you, when you put this stuff on your resume, uh, it's going to really, really help you. Now, these last two, again, are the visualization, the data science. And then the last one down here is uh, what we did is we focused on the, the big data uh, issue as well, because it is really almost a separate issue. So we've got a course specifically on dealing with uh, how, do you, how do you structure large data sets? How do you structure, what tools do you use? And we will use some of the industry tools again. There's, there, there are tools called Hadoop um, and, and uh, MapReduce, other things that are very specific to this industry. And you won't be an expert on big data, but you'll at least know a lot more than just the, the, what you've learned from the short webinar. And again, that's going to give you tremendous number of skills that are very, very resonant with the industry right now. And that's why we're, we're very happy and very uh, intrigued with this new program uh, that is really a combination of art and science. Uh, and it's really the art part. It's really the understanding the business, the insight to the business that is more important here. The science can be taught, but understanding the business comes from working there or working in other businesses and getting that insight. So that's a little overview. What I wanted to, to end with here is just a couple little slides on the, the program. Uh, what we want to do is make sure if you have any other questions, you want to you uh, go to uh, ip.extension.uci.edu and or, or just search that. You can come to our, our website at the University of California at Irvine under Extension, and you'll see a whole list of international programs. Uh, so these programs are very practical. They're going to enhance the value of your degree, your existing degree, or the degree you're about to get. And the cool thing is you get to participate not only in some very, very practical skills, but you'll be able to participate in, in field trips and potentially uh, take some optional pa uh, practical training, which is incredibly valuable, not only for your resume, but also to get you hooked up with businesses in the United States, 
even if you go back to your home country uh, with uh, having experience with U.S. companies, that's going to give you tremendous advantage because all companies are looking for people with international business skills. Um, you know, everybody, the world is a, is a global environment now. So having that experience uh, here in the United States, uh, having some fun here in the United States, uh, and we do a great job of combining really some, some great skills development with uh, some, some fun activities uh, and some uh, connections with other uh, students, uh, not only the U.S. students, but other international students. It's a wonderful environment to network, and that's incredibly important. Networking is the way people get jobs, uh, and, and there's a tr tremendous asset. And again, what we just talked about was the skill set in this particular ACP, uh, but it comes from a very large and respected university. This is the University of California, and it is very highly respected. And having that on top of your resume with your existing degree from your existing school is tremendously valuable in the industry. And what we do is we do have both the internships and the optical pra optional practical training. Uh, once you take the ACP course, you're eligible for the three month, and this is an unpaid internship, which honestly makes it easier for us to place people. And that's again, the thing that's gonna happen with the Orange County and Los Angeles students. And uh, you're gonna learn a tremendous amount by being in those companies. That's where you get that art of business that we spoke about. The more times you've been exposed to different businesses, see how they run, see what's important to them, see how their marketing works, see how their sales work, see how their product development works, uh, you get a lot more insight to bring with you to uh, the kind of things you need to do for uh, data science and predictive analytics, but also what you need to do to get any job in the future is have those, those business skills. And again, like we said, you really expand your professional network there. Now, once you've done a couple ACPs in an internship, you are, you are uh, eligible for optional practical training, and that is working in a full-time uh, salaried position, and that can be up for up to a year, and that's an incredibly valuable thing because, you know, you've changed your visa at that point. You've gotten uh, the ability to actually work and make money in the United States. So this process is very, very valuable, uh, and, and again, for this particular set of skills, uh, you know, business intelligence, uh, data science, and all the things we talked about today uh, can help with many, many of those um, things. The last couple slides here are just the, the requirements here. Uh, we do uh, ask that you're in a program or have substantial experience, experience in, in the uh, area related to the certificate you wish to pursue. The TOEFL scores are listed here, and then we have a committee that will take a look at your skills. What you want to do is here's the main website here. Um, you know, if you can't, if you don't remember it or you, can't, you don't get back on this recording, again, just use Google and look for UC Irvine uh, under extension, under international programs, and you will, um, you will find that. You'll go through a bunch of steps there, and your completed application uh, will be submitted to, through via email. Uh, there's some things you'll need to fax to us. Uh, but if you have any questions, go to the website. Uh, there's a wonderful staff available to t uh, talk with you and help you move through this process. Uh, again, it's incredibly valuable to have this experience. When we, are, uh, when we do have you here, again, it's not just academic. Uh, we have a, a wonderful team that does a tremendous amount of outings and team building. Uh, we go over to Disneyland. We go up to Hollywood. We, we play in our back bay. Uh, we do a lot of uh, small local events where we're doing some of the team building things with volleyball. It, it's a very good process that we run you through here. It's very fun. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, a great set of uh, academic uh, choices you have. And we are one of the largest uh, schools that do this in the United States. Uh, we've done this for a very long time. Uh, we know how to make it fun and valuable for you. So please, if you are interested in all, have uh, some questions, uh, contact us. Um, and I see Nancy's chimed in there for the few questions on the discussion forum as well. So this is really valuable. If you have any other questions, again, please contact our international programs. 
If you have questions on this particular program, you can uh, uh, get my contact information from them. And with that, I don't see any other questions. We're just about out of time of our hour here. Again, if you are uh, listening to this on the recorded version, same thing, come to our website here. Let me go back to it real quick. The website is right here with any other questions you might have. Our phone number's there, our contact information is there, and uh, you know, we'd be happy to help you move down along your path to have some, have some fun here, but also gain some incredibly valuable skills and experience in the United States uh, business market. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you to all of us. Uh, let's see if I've got the last slide here. There it is. Oh, yeah, this is, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, this is a slide that gives you a sample calendar. And this is wonderful, right, because it shows you all of the fun things that we're doing in a particular uh, a week, right? So in this particular uh, time, this was back last year, but they went to California uh, Adventure in Disneyland that day, then they went to the beach this next day, and then they had either tennis or soccer this day. Uh, they have activities every day. They went to Universal Studios, so, so this is fun. I want to do this. This is really fun. They went to an Angels baseball game. Uh, and again, during all this time, of course, they're taking classes as well. But again, they keep the students. It's very, very fun. So it's a very cultural experience. You, you get a lot of diversity in here. I get to try different food. And we would really, really uh, enjoy seeing you here uh, in our wonderful beach here in California. So please feel free to contact us. You have uh, Nancy uh, Warzer Brady and uh, Ying Ding uh, is our, our academic advisors. You've got their contact information there. Please feel free to contact them uh, with any other questions. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your attention and your time on this. We really hope to see you here in California in the future. Thanks again, everybody.